Hello, everyone. This is John Crimes with the Always. And Desi Madigan. <laughs> Miss Desi Madigan here coming for a next podcast episode. And what are we doing this week, Desi? Oh, this one was tough. This one was about Susan Powell out of Utah and her husband, Josh, which the husband himself is, is a trip. But and yeah, this other one's interesting a, characters. <laughs> oh, very. I guess when you introduce the other characters, you understand why Josh is the way he is or was. But yes. yeah. Th- this was uh probably the craziest to 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 look into and to research. Um and this became so much we have to have another meeting and I'm like, there's no way we can do this with one episode. So that's why you guys haven't seen us uh last week. We we took a lot because this is going to be multiple episodes there was a lot of information here my goodness i mean as soon as you uncover one layer of the story then there's another person then there's another character then there's something else you discover and it's still not over by the way i mean this happened years ago but it's it's still going with the family (laughs) you think uh you know, uh, as I looked up other cases and or, or ones that are higher profile, Chris Watts and uh, right. Scott Peterson, these details, I'm wondering why this is wasn't. I mean, this is pretty getting pretty popular now, but mm-hmm. I would think this would have been way up there, you know. Well, I remember when it happened that it did become kind of a, a big deal, you know, mm-hmm. you know, the Good Morning Americas and the Today Show type of thing. But one thing I'm starting to discover a lot is I think this was what 2010 right yes okay social media is massively important now to make a case get big I mean even though the details are pretty similar to everything that happens either you know now or 20 years ago you still have the same players the husbands the wives the affairs the life insurance policies it's all the same but People, social media pushes it. Yeah, people are using social media different, uh, different now. You know, like uh, a lot of things that are involving negativity or crime, murder, right. drama are, are much more on the forefront now. So that could be a reason why it isn't. But I think when they hear this story, people are going to agree uh, with us that this is uh, is is extremely fortunate, unfortunate too. Uh, the other than it should be popular history extremely well, uh, sad yeah when i noticed like the watts one that you that you mentioned everybody mm-hmm. who's ever heard of true crime knows the watts case um i think the reason this one and that one like the watts case is there's something we don't have in a lot of other stories which is video footage of the actual victim and self-recorded you yeah. know um sometimes it's just so and so went missing out of this town or another here's a picture of them here's a here's a missing poster but with this one the susan powell case um everybody recorded themselves in the story a and lot, yeah. the the watts case you have shanann who recorded every bit of her life so i think these cases where the victim is actually speaking to you can see their movement third dimensional characters it really does play a big part in yes this. Mm-hmm. yes it does and uh i don't know why <laughs> but my dog is coming in here and rolling in a circle and staring at me really really crazy he's he's super max right now so if that's what you hear he's in a cane he's here the voice he's in a cane i don't blame him <laughs> yeah <laughs> but none, nonetheless that's why i'm glad like uh we we the last thing we do is we come together and we talk like this when you hear the right. story the story is already recorded and finished and edited, so uh, that audio will be crystal clear. So, but for right now, as we're talking on video, you may hear some tap dancing in the background. I'm really wanting to know what um, you know the listeners think of the format that we do. Yes, you know the the, the storytelling because any you know you turn on YouTube podcasts, there's an infinite amount of yeah you know um, creators, content creators podcast hosts who are telling you the same story over and over, which is, which is fine. You can never hear it enough just for justice for the victims, but our storytelling, you know, way, uh, this was your brilliant 
you know, idea to, <laughs> to kind of um, bring it out in a storytelling form. Yeah. Um, I wonder what the audience feels about it. So I, I'd like to know some feedback for any of the listeners, what they think of that. I, I wanted it, uh, I think... <laughs> One of the biggest reasons I said it would be great to do it is uh, when I was doing my documentary on the Zach and Addie case, when I was yeah. doing research on it, I, I purchased a book uh, called Shake the Devil, but okay. I didn't have time to read it. So after buying the book, I still went back and bought the audio uh, version. Mm -hmm. And it was a it was the storytelling that was putting me in. I was cutting my hair and everything, and I can visualize okay. everything at the way that they was telling the story, and it drew me in. So you get the facts. The facts are always first and foremost. You make sure you have those aligned. And then you create a way that you feel that will draw and make the listener feel like they are they are right there, you know, in the midst. So um, something I, I thought would be great with that we implement it. So uh, you're right. I would love to hear uh, what everyone is saying about, you know, doing it that way. Yeah. 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 I, what, I, it, I like it, too. But like you said, same reasons. Audiobooks. I think that's why they're so popular, because they do more than what the books do and they yeah. they add the background um sounds you got a river they'll you'll hear a river mm -hmm. you hear the actual audio of the whoever it is that the subject is so um i think that's hopefully what we're pulling off here too yes and if you guys want to have fun with us you can see we have really really silly chemistry you guys don't get to see that because we don't do it when we're talking yeah. about something as serious but you can come check us now uh on our partner you now uh that we go live on we've come up with a creative way to let you all interact with us we got this true crime game we're going to be playing now on you now and all you got to do is search for alibiish on you now a l i b i uh hyphen i s h you will find us and i think we'll be doing what team desi and team john team john and team desi so we have somebody on on desi's team somebody on my team and we'll play uh true crime games it's very very fun very very entertaining so uh just another way you can learn yeah. us and get another aspect of how we are um and also keep in mind that's how you can find us on all social media uh, a L I B I hyphen I S H Alibi ish. Yes. And we're also on Alibi ish podcast on Facebook. That's our Facebook page. So mm -hmm. anything that you want to send or comments or give us a like or follow on any of those pages, we really appreciate that. Awesome. So, so we ran, uh, rambled long enough without uh, further ado. Here is our next story coming to you now. Josh Powell gazes out of the window of this dark yellow room right on time as the last piece of furniture is moved out of the way. A typical room, but today it isn't so typical. For there are bright lights on stands all seem to be aiming at these two chairs. Two heavy, expensive-looking cameras are on set, I should say, with one aimed at one chair while the other is aimed at the other chair. Josh knows the layout of the house, but it's foreign to maneuver through with all the new cords and wires sprung along the carpet. Josh tries to appear to look unbothered as he accidentally lock eyes to what he would feel would be his adversary in the room. A blonde woman whom I'm sure his father would call attractive. Josh thinks, where is his father? As he adjusts his maroon shirt, Josh is purposely trying to look scruffy, worn out. If I were ever asked who does he look like at this very moment in his life, I'd say a main course of Tom Green, goatee included, with a side order of a serious Gomer Powell, naivety included. <laughs> Josh is mentally multitasking at the moment. Half of his thoughts on focusing to portray the sleepless mind of a husband that has no idea of the whereabouts of his lost wife. 
One by all intents and purposes was last seen with him in December of 2009, just two years prior to this date. His other thoughts on how to sound believable in front of this blonde adversary dressed in black with an ABC News badge hanging from her neck. Josh has found himself in the same place as many men before him. So many men nowadays, I feel a new club should be formed. Let's call it Club Bad Alibi Husbands of Missing Wives. Oh, an honorary president of such club would be Scott Peterson, a man whose wife will go missing just Christmas Eve of 2002. Scott portraying himself as the lovely husband, as they always do. However, it turns out he was having an affair with another woman. Oh, and his alibi on this date? He was fishing on New Year's Eve. Yes, alone. Scott didn't meet this particular blonde adversary on national television, but he too was questioned all the same, the very same way Josh is about to be questioned just moments from now. Succeeding Josh is another husband. Stay tuned as I'm sure he'll be covered on this podcast. This husband will go by the name of Chris Watts. I for sure would put Chris Watts as the president of the Bad Alibi Husbands of Missing Wives Club. For when his wife goes missing for all of just two days, he got the same questioning on national television. Electing to do his arms folded on the front porch saying how he went to work that morning. Not such a bad alibi since he was telling the truth. Only that they'll go on to find his wife right there on his job site where he was working alone. I'm starting to see a trend here and if this trend rings true, then we have at least our motive of real reason Josh is looking so flustered as he takes a seat right in the bright lights across from the blind news reporter, Abby Boudreaux. Oh, there are no filler out portions as Abby gets right into it. Did you kill your wife? No. Is what was on Josh's mind as he answers the question quickly while shaking his head to further confirm he had nothing to do with it. Oh, it all must be downhill from now on as the hard question was already asked. What could possibly go wrong today after I pass the hardest test? This is until Josh is shocked with a similar, more detailed question. Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of your wife? No. Nothing? Nothing. Josh's chest now beating as fast as yours would beat when your parents called your name in a tone that lets you know you are in trouble. But for sure the hard part is now over seriously as his wife could only be dead or missing and both of those questions are now answered. So Josh tells himself to smile a little during the next question and to make sure he says good things about his own personality. What is the truth? People who know me know that I'm a good dad. I work hard. I put my sons first. I was a good husband. I took care of my family. And I see you're still wearing your wedding band. Yeah. You still love her? Yeah. I guess you could say that I still love her. Two mistakes there, Joshi. Why on earth would you say you were a good husband? Hmm. Is there something wrong with your wife that we don't know about, Josh? And the spacing and timing of the crying was excellent. However, you forgot something. The tears. Josh quote unquote cries and asks can he leave the room. He's doing great, he thinks, as the news reporter Abby Boudreaux goes over her notes for the next round of questions. The cinema photographer checks the dailies. Josh is confidently in the bathroom, all going along as planned for Josh, whom I'd assume went to the bathroom to talk to his father, Stephen Powell, that he always leans on. But Stephen has his eyes on Abby Boudreaux. Pacing back and forth, Stephen cannot hold in his secret any longer. He demands to speak to the reporter. 
Abby reluctantly lets him take the seat. As he drops something so huge, Abby will go on to call a bombshell. Susan was uh, very, very sexual with me. She was very flirtatious. I mean, I'm, I'm her father-in-law, and uh, she, she would do a lot of things that, that um, I mean, she was just, she did it. I did. I mean, we, we interacted in a lot of sexual ways because Susan enjoys doing that. Do you think a part of you started falling in love with Susan? That's pretty likely, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I would say so. And, and, I, and, and there's no question in my mind that the feelings were mutual. Now that is a little more than a bombshell. That's more like a Hiroshima. Well, an alleged Hiroshima, for this is not only not confirmed, but this can go in many directions. Did we just hear from a loving father trying to help a son that's the primary suspect in his wife's disappearance? Or is this a father that's truly in love with his son's missing wife? Is she truly in love with him back? Or is it something else completely different that's going on here? Only way to find out is to find out just who is Josh's wife. Brayden and Charlie Powell's mommy was Susan Cox Powell. And while you usually introduce people by just their names, being those boys' mommy was Susan's identity during what we know as her final days. Susan Marie Cox was born October 16, 1981. She's the third daughter of Charles and Judy Cox, born in New Mexico and living in Alaska for some time before her family finally settled in Washington State when she was just a child. She was brought up as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and as her Susan Cox Powell Foundation website states, Susan is an outgoing, optimistic person with a servant's heart and boundless energy. She's characterized by her faith in her Heavenly Father, her determination to provide for her children, and her belief that families are forever. Her faith is an example for others, including her two boys. Susan was a strikingly lovely woman, golden brown hair and blue eyes that sparkled when she smiled and her eyes would squint. And as her eventual missing posters and family photos would show, she had a huge grin that hid a lot of what she was feeling inside or would end up enduring during her years leading up to her unfortunate disappearance. Right out of high school, about eight days after graduation, she began studying at the Jean Juarez Academy of Cosmetology. She was an incredibly dedicated and hard worker, so much so that later on in life, she would eventually begin her days at 7.30 in the morning going to school and going to her hair cutting job only to follow that up with a second job at a J.C. Penney jewelry counter for the second half of the day leading late into the evening. Susan was just 19 years old when she met Josh Powell at Institute of Religion for college age members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and it was at a dinner party at Josh's apartment in Tacoma in November of 2000 that she met him. In fact, they both mark the day of November 11th, 2000 as the official beginning of their dating. Although, as Josh would later recount, they had actually met years before when Susan was 12 and Josh was about 18 years old. He visited the Cox family home when he was just a kid that played the piano and he was friends with Susan's sister, Mary. He recounts in his writings or in his recordings that he found it a little off-putting that she was 12, but still attracted to a 12-year-old child when he was 18. Okay. At this dinner, Susan volunteered to help 
Josh with the dishes. It's, it was a turning point for him as that would be the moment that he claimed he fell in love with her. He loved the idea of a woman doing something to serve him, to do something for him. They shared their first kiss that night, and that's when Susan said she knew Josh was the one. I mean, after all the girls that Josh pursued, Susan was different, and he pursued many girls and was striking out left and right, being rejected time and time again. Susan thought he was attractive or hot, as she wrote, and she appreciated him being part of the Church of Latter-day Saints. During this time of them meeting, she was on a rebound from a breakup and liked the fact that he was five years older, seemed more mature, had his own place, and was a church-going boy. At least, that's what she thought. Their first movie date was to watch The Perfect Storm, and they also ate some Subway sandwiches. In Josh's recorded message, he would describe how quickly he fell in love with her and how much he wants to be with her forever. That quickly, within their first one or two dates. But there was more than dishwashing and church-going that Josh loved about Susan. She had excellent and clean credit something he did not, something he squandered with his spending habits and his high debts. He was the, I want it now, I'll get it now type of guy. There was a computer that was perhaps out of his budget. He'd buy it on credit only to not pay it back or let debts escalate. She was a caretaker on the other hand, kind and generous with Josh. She would randomly clean up or dust when there was nothing else to do in the apartment, something Josh would point out as a fact that he loved about her and the countless breathy recordings and writings and musings that he would keep to document his interactions and what really felt like assessments of Susan. Susan began spending a lot of time at Josh's apartment, something she regularly did and something her parents were not aware of as she was living with her sister Mary at the time. And it was one day, out of the blue, while she was working at that JCPenney jewelry counter, that Josh randomly showed up with the ruse of looking for a ring for his mom and using Susan's own employee discount to purchase it. She helped him look, pick out a ring, purchase the ring with her discount. Now, you can't tell, but... Um, kind of rolling my eyes at the notion that this ring that he purchased, and I'm not spoiling anything here, was actually her own engagement ring that he purchased using her employee discount. A theme, you know, being frugal or penny pinching is something that he would carry on to an extreme level later in their marriage. It was January 5th, 2001. Susan went to his apartment after work. These late night trips to his apartment was something that would always concern Susan's father as he would worry about his daughter walking the streets or the neighborhood late at night all alone. And he would tell her of this, but she wouldn't have it any other way. She was infatuated with Josh. That night, Josh covered her eyes and led her into the apartment. He had a dozen white roses waiting and a photo of the Portland Temple in a frame. And while being recorded on a camcorder, another recurring theme in the story is using a camcorder. He read her a poem that he had written when he was a teenager about marriage and what a woman's place is, which is that of a wife. Marriage is for the most in love, for two so deeply in love, they become the love they sow within each other. Marriage can only suffice me when all was true love waxes. When her greatest love, and so she is solely for me, and me solely for her. He had her read a hymn. He then proposed, and she accepted. They had only been dating less than two months at this point, and the entire proposal was a full production, almost like he was putting on a show more for the camera and less for the moment that he was having with Susan. Needless to say, her parents were 
very unhappy about it. Her friends were unhappy about it and perhaps a bit concerned as they didn't quite see what in the world she saw in him and also how quickly this was moving. They seemed polar opposites. He was aggressive and domineering down to filling out and mailing out the marriage license application during the midst of a heated argument and giving Susan no choice in the matter. She was more passive and submissive, almost a perfect person to hone in on for someone like Josh Powell. Her father took his concerns to their bishop and exclaimed that he was not happy with the mate his daughter had chosen. They eventually did marry April 6, 2001 at the Portland Temple. And only people who were true believers or members of the church were allowed in for the ceremony, so the rest had to wait outside along with the children. That would include most of Josh's family. They all waited outside. The only person during the ceremony was his sister, Jennifer, the one sister whose life he was hoping to emulate with Susan. She had a stable home. She had a happy marriage things that were missing from Josh's own childhood, and Jennifer's too. They spent the evening of the wedding at the Hood River Inn on the Columbia River, and as Susan would later discover, Josh was very much a procrastinator and not very motivated in anything. Again, the polar opposite of her. She was very motivated and always stuck to whatever plan she had written out for herself. He was always late to everything. He was even late to his own wedding, something Susan began to despise almost immediately. Susan looked very pretty on her wedding day. She was wearing a white, very conservative, flowy dress with a floral cut design on both sleeves, and her short, shoulder-length brown hair was adorned with just a simple white veil and minimal makeup. She can be heard on video telling the guest of the proposal story and how excited she was to show off her new husband and her new wedding ring. But as the reception went on, Josh began to ignore her more and more, spending more time with his own family and not really paying attention to where Susan was or what she was doing or wanting to take photos. Sure, there were times where Susan looked happy, dancing, smiling, posing for pictures, alone or with friends. But as the time went on, her face changed and she was sad most of the time. She had a sad look on her face, more agitated. Susan's brand new husband spent more of his time on his dad's camcorder and documenting the logistics and the decor of the day and not really how pretty or his wife looked, or how much he loved her. During the reception, Susan danced with her father, and the song choice was Wake Up, Little Susie, which was apropos to what her father then said. It was probably an important song. She should have woke up a little sooner. So the new Powells now entered Newlywed Bliss. Upon learning that a teacher failed a five-year-old child by the name of Josh Powell, who was born January 20th of 1976, my first thoughts were how horrible does a child's painting have to be to get failed at such an early age? I began to get intrigued at the possibilities. Was Josh a troubled child that throws paint around the room for attention? Or was he the second coming of Picasso far beyond his years for his teacher to understand the beauty in his work? I mean, in kindergarten I've drawn some atrocities in the eyes of an adult today, but my teachers seem to all give me a passing grade. Or did Josh make up that as a reason he didn't like his teacher and most importantly, was this a woman teacher? He was a middle child sandwiched between an older sister, Jennifer, and a younger brother by the name of John, nice name by the way, by the previously mentioned Stephen and Teresa, and he'd go on to have another younger brother by the name of Michael and younger sister Alina. 
Also, as mentioned previously, he would grow up being rejected over and over again by women. And he'll be the first person in my entire life to ever receive an illegitimate baptizing. As this will come from his voyeurs, oops, I meant Father Stephen, who has secretly gone apostate in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Josh showed intelligence far before learning how to build computers from scratch as early on as he taught himself long division. It seems he could master anything that required only him and him alone, with problems often coming when someone told him to do something. I mean, ask yourself, would a child smart enough to teach himself long division struggle in a math class? I think because he was being told to do so, it is the order, the structure, the rules, all things that would become a trend in Josh's short lifespan. Oops. You'll hear later on how Josh will fear taking a specialized lie detector test that could measure sexual arousal. Hey, don't look at me. I didn't invent the device. However, given that as early as fifth grade, Josh's mom would find out Stephen was writing illicit sexual stories about another man's wife. I can now already understand why his dad would sit in that chair and tell an ABC reporter the explicit story he did of his son's wife. I can now understand how Josh would fear such a device much later in life. They say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You see, Josh wanted to control his wife Susan. His father Stephen got caught writing about another man's wife in a journal and instead of praying like the fake apostle should and asking for forgiveness, he would simply tell his wife if her husband leaves, he can then add her on as his second wife. Oh, the defiance, the stubbornness. Stephen and both Josh never wanting to conform. Apple in the tree, hey? Sticking away from the norms of their religion, Stephen told his boys, and notice I said boys, not children, that people were all animals that can sleep with whoever they want. Please take Stephen literally as when he says anyone. We will be revisiting this later on in the story. Stephen began to purposely go against the church, teasing his own boys about Boy Scouts as it was sponsored by the church until Josh quit. He made his son quit from teasing him. The control mechanism. Daddy's approval becomes so much for Josh that this divide in Steve and the church causes a rift in his boys, causing Josh to lash out and try to stab his mother, kill animals all the while Jennifer was turning against her own father. This disdain for the church, in my opinion, because it went against his devious thoughts, caused Stephen to tell his daughter Jennifer that it isn't real, which caused his wife to move out. Stephen couldn't sustain his plan of keeping his family under one roof, but without the religion they've based their entire life upon. Bigger problems would loom as his son, yes, Josh, would try to hang himself at 14 years old. I believe it's this possible death of their son that caused Teresa to move back in. But what happens when families move back together, but they only do it for the children? We all know it typically does not last long and it gets worse. Through all of this turmoil, Josh is now 16 and he receives his first of many, many rejections from a girl that's a couple of years older by the name of Sarah. Sarah understands that she's moving away. She understands that she does not share these feelings for Josh, but she doesn't have the willpower to tell him directly. Because of this, he hangs around her and she allows it. So Josh goes in for his first kiss, which she gives him reluctantly. To me, it was sort of a, a constellation prize since she's moving so far away. And as Josh received this rejection from Sarah, who he would still keep in contact with from time to time, only as friends. He rides home in the car with his father and he realizes something is amiss. That's when his father tells him that his mother finally filed for divorce. And this is a nasty divorce. Remember, Teresa is fully into the church and this is something that Stephen is strictly against. 
And this is what he uses in court as he tries to paint her as a witch, religious nut hound that's trying to inflict a strict religion onto his children. The important thing to note that while he cannot be successful in getting Jennifer over, his two older children, Josh and John, which are his boys that look up to him, he knows that they will go with him. So Stephen is trying to get the courts to allow him to have custody of Michael and Alina. So Stephen is trying to get the courts to let him have custody of Michael and Alina. But he should have put more stock into that relationship with Jennifer for it is of her story of physical altercations that will further allow the courts to give custody to Teresa of the younger two children as he will take both boys. Josh is at the age of total defiance in high school and at this age whoever comes off as the most strict will be the parent that the kid will not like. Funny how this still goes on today in our world. So with Teresa laying down the law for Josh, giving him a curfew, telling him the chores he must do, Josh being in total defiance, this is the reason why he wants to run off and live with his father. Let's take a time to reflect on the mindset of Josh as Josh is being rejected by girls. He is starting to dislike his mother through her authority she has over him, which he doesn't like. This could be a reason why Josh wants affection from girls. He wants a woman or girl figure that he can put his authority over. This is why he seeks the affection so strongly from women. An example would be the night his mother locked him and John out of the house and she called the police as he tried to barge through the door. The police stopping Josh is another example of being rejected by a woman in power. So he stays with his father, he goes to a new school, he meets a girl by the name of Mary who rejects him as well. This is the interesting part. He meets a girl by the name of Becky and they hit it off perfectly. And for the first time in his life, Josh turns a girl down. But did he? As Josh would go on to say that he didn't like when she went dancing with friends and even dancing with herself. I take that as she's a free spirit, an untamed free spirit that Josh didn't feel he would ever be able to tame. So without even trying in a roundabout way, without even realizing it, Becky actually rejected Josh, keeping his rejection streak going. This isn't something Josh likes as he doesn't want to see his sister successful in the marriage. Josh attends Pierce College, and as he does this, his sister gets married. This isn't something that Josh likes, as he doesn't want to see her successful in the marriage before he can be. I want you to note this for later as well. Josh gets his associate's degree, then moves on to the University of Washington in Seattle, where he is immediately bullied by pranks, jokes, and plain old body slams. Oh, yeah. He switches majors, failing at both, and became depressed. He switches schools again, and this time he meets a woman by the name of Catherine Terry. In my opinion, this is his first relationship ever, where there is a mutual feelings amongst her liking Josh and Josh liking her. They hit it off. Josh would break up with her for no reason, then say he wants to be friends, then break up with her again. Why? Why would Josh do this over and over again if he's never really had a serious relationship? Because it's never really about the serious relationship. It's about the control of a woman. And in order to flex his narcissistic muscles, he must show that he can break it off and get back with her whenever he wants to. Josh will then ask her to move in, then begin to spend her money. His first time in life doing this, but not your first time hearing it. She'll meet all of his siblings except for Jennifer. And the weird thing is, Josh would go off on her if she's ever alone in the room with one of his brothers. Note that for later. He told Catherine to pretend they are married, but also that he didn't want to ever be married flexing his I'm in charge muscles again to secure authority over Catherine. And this gets downright nasty. Catherine's uncle dies. Josh flat out refuses to let her go to the funeral. And why? 
because her uncle opposed their relationship once. Nothing can come in the way between what Josh wants and his demands. He even gets bold as his father Stevens feels so bad for Catherine that he tries to get her to also go to the funeral. He even insists that he'd pay for it. Josh still refuses to let her go. It probably could have bought him some more time as this relationship was bound to be over. But that refusal, the first time Catherine gets away, she will not go back and she will as he lets her go home to see a friend in Utah. She calls Josh telling him she isn't coming back. The next time he see her, she would be with her new fiance as he's meeting her to give her her clothes back that he left in storage. Catherine's fiance stated that as they pulled off, he looked in the mirror and he saw Josh behind them. He feels that Josh was letting it all seek in that he would let her get away. I think that this is the reason that Susan Powell is missing. Josh behind that car watching as his power is completely gone nothing he can do so the next time he'll make sure he's in total control allegedly josh would go on to harass women after women two sisters and elder after she rejected him then her younger cousin he'd go on to drive over two thousand miles to creep another woman out Josh would move back to Tacoma, Washington, going back to school when he would meet again for the first time, Susan Powell. Insert using Susan. Insert bad relationship. Insert wedding day. Insert not paying attention to Susan at their wedding. But at least now, we know why. We did not trust renting. We are paying off Josh's debts while he finishes up school and gets a job, and for his credit to clean up so we can get a loan to get a house. I want a house. I want a house to come home to so I can prepare meals for Josh and clean and decorate. Susan wrote this in her journal shortly after being married and still in the newlywed phase. Eight months later, sadly, in 2002, they were evicted. Josh's money trouble, his debts, his instability, his odd jobs, his quitting jobs, getting fired, terrible spending habits were just too much on the young couple. So they moved into Josh's father Steve's house in order to save for their own place and be able to pay off their debts sooner. Steve and his other two sons, John and Michael Powell, were all living there already, so the house was already cramped enough. Josh and Susan were then forced to sleep in the living room and use bed sheets for walls or privacy. Not exactly ideal for a young, newlywed couple. Steve... John and Michael all came and went at all hours of the day and night, making sleeping incredibly difficult. Susan's father-in-law, Steve, was practically attached to his camcorder. And that didn't change once Josh and Susan moved in. In fact, it may have escalated. Steve was always filming everything and everyone, but he was especially fixated on Susan Powell, his new daughter-in-law. We don't get many girls around here, so you're going to get the full treatment, he'd tell her. She'd laugh it off, kind of that uncomfortable, nervous laughter. She usually tolerated the camera and being followed around. She was almost a little too nice, maybe too polite. Most of us, I think, would be very uncomfortable living in a Truman Show type situation. Susan in these recordings, who would come off as quite naive during these encounters with Steve. He would follow her throughout the entire house, no matter what she was doing. During this time, she was a cosmetology student, so she would like to show off her progress and things that she would learn. One day, she showed her waxed legs to her father-in-law, Steve, and surprised how long this wax lasted on her legs. No hair! Woohoo! 
Ooh, she said. Steve would interpret this interaction as flirty. There were times where Susan would find a mirror under the crack of a bathroom or bedroom door. And more times than not, Steve would try to undermine the marriage between his son and his new wife, pointing out things that Josh wouldn't do that perhaps he would. Also trying to draw a wedge between the couple. Susan would write in her journals that this was a dark time for her with dark thoughts. And she also felt like her husband's faith was not strong. He wasn't as committed to the church as she was. I know the gospel is true. I can't pretend it's really not important and move on to more worldlier things. She knew they had to leave Steve's house as it was becoming increasingly uneasy. And thankfully, by March 2002, they were back in their own place in Yakima. Josh then began a new job at Home Depot, and she got a raise at her job and a new car. But like most times at new jobs, Josh wouldn't last very long, and he got fired right away. They argued often, and more times than not, Josh would get his way, just like he would when he was a child. Push, push, argue, and argue until the other party is exhausted and Susan would easily become exhausted. Josh finally finished all his courses that June, and they had a graduation ceremony that his father showed up to, along with his camcorder. He recorded everything that day, but mainly Susan. Josh was getting and losing jobs like clockwork during this time, and it was because he always felt that he knew more than his bosses, that he was better, and that he was holding out for management, that certain jobs were beneath him, so he would lose them. Susan was a more stable worker. And while he was bouncing from job to job, even the idea of enlisting in the military was discussed. But this frightened Susan as she was fearing leaving alone or being a young widow. When Susan would walk back and forth from her car to her job or leave her home or do minimal things throughout her house or the backyard or front yard, she always felt like she was being watched. And that's because she was. Steve, her father-in-law, would go to Yakima and record Susan no matter where she was or what she was doing. No, it, it wasn't a house visit. He would just drive to record her and then go home. Susan and Josh then began working at a senior living facility together at this point, and she was still being harassed and visited by her father-in-law at their home, and of course, recorded time and time again. One day, when Josh decided he no longer wanted to work at the senior living facility and he wanted to try trucking, Steve drove him an hour away to a job that required staying there for a few days while he trained for this trucking job. Susan came along to drop him off. Driving back, it was probably one of the longest drives of Susan's life. Listening to her father-in-law tell her that he was in love with her. I don't know where you're going with this. I mean, I'm married to your son. Can't I just be your daughter-in-law, a step beneath your own children? Susan also explained how inappropriate his feelings were and his actions and how uncomfortable she was with the way he would kiss her when he would greet her, something even her own father wouldn't do, and how much she did not like that. Let's remember, Susan was 21, and Steve, her father-in-law, was 53 years old. That request to be left alone fell on deaf ears, and he went on trying to justify why he was feeling the way he was and explaining why that leg-waxing scenario is what prompted this. She also let him know, though, that she would inform Josh about this conversation. We know of this conversation taking place in the car because Steve, of course, was recording when he was saying goodbye to his son and dropping him off, 
He pushed a button that he thought was the off button, but it never stopped recording. Um, you know, it just, for example, when we were sitting on the couch, it just felt like you were very, um, you know, I, I mean, I was extremely aroused, and I think you were somewhat aroused, at least I thought. Susan was far too nice to her father-in-law and way too patient with the level of constant harassment, sexual comments, and outright disrespect that she received from Steve. Susan then expressed her uneasiness and discomfort to Josh as they eventually then moved to Utah in December of 2003. They moved with the help of Steve, of course. Susan had years worth of journals that she would keep since she was a teenager, something her father had encouraged her to do so she would leave her wisdom for future generations. She had journals from when she was a teenager all the way until 2003 stored in a storage facility while they moved along with some photos. Unfortunately for Susan, Steve not only had access to the storage, he helped himself to these items and would scan them for his future use. He'd store them on his desktop, the desktop that had a screensaver of just his daughter-in-law. My goodness, the level of intrusiveness, the utter feeling of being violated when someone takes advantage of your private items and abuses them that way. They stayed with Josh's sisters, Jennifer and her family, until they were able to find their own place. It is here that Jennifer, Josh's sister, would see the change in her brother. He was more controlling, more aggressive, more like their father, Steve. But Susan did try to push back a bit. She would resist and defend herself. After both getting jobs at Fidelity and finding a realtor, they found a 2,200 square foot home on Sarah Circle in West Valley City. This was a new stressor with the added financial burden of a mortgage and a temporary working status that they both had. This Fidelity call center was the perfect job for Susan and her outgoing personality, but Josh struggled in data entry, so he was let go. And now it was even more stressful with just one income, Susan's income. Josh then had yet another bright idea of becoming a millionaire overnight as a realtor, selling homes, selling real estate. It was during this frustrating time with the different changes of careers that Josh would dream up that she felt like she had to be the grown up in the relationship with him. She became the sole breadwinner while obtaining her stockbroker license, and it's also when she learned she was pregnant with her first child. She welcomed her first son, Charles Joshua Powell, or Charlie, January 1st, 2005. The Cox parents had to come to Utah to help when their daughter went into labor because Josh was too busy on the computer. He couldn't be bothered to help his wife when she was giving birth. Frustrations and more frustrations. I am depressed and stressed because Josh wants me to possibly go back to work again and doesn't seem to want to focus on the real estate. And the church is covering our utilities and our groceries and I feel like a mooch. And Josh always wants the easy way out and never gets around to supporting his family. She wrote in an April 2005 journal entry. Josh would not so much as help change a diaper or, or take an interest in being a father, but would always put on a picture of wedded and familial bliss for others. They were under a lot of financial stress, no physical affection from Josh to Susan. Susan was constantly fighting for her marriage, but growing increasingly frustrated. She quit Fidelity for good and in May 2007 took out a second mortgage just to get by. Soon after, a second child followed, Brayden Timothy Powell, born January 2nd, 2007. 
boy did Susan now have her hands full. Two babies, Josh, bills, a mortgage, and only one car for work. They filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy in April of 2007. So Susan tried everything to save money. She tried to grow her own garden, clip coupons, bake her own bread. She felt alone and unappreciated. She then got a new job with her stockbroker's license at Wells Fargo Investments and again became the sole breadwinner. Oddly enough, Josh became even more controlling. Even with Susan's own money, she controlled nothing. In a Facebook message she sent to a friend, she wrote, He's mainly financially, emotionally, and mentally abusive. I'm basically a single mother, and he takes my money. They fought and fought. She even slapped him once. And he told her it would be the last time that she'd ever do that. Susan's parents knew that she was being abused. She may have not have shown physical signs of it, but that was not the daughter they knew before she met Josh. They gave her a secret phone in case she needed to escape with the boys. She even secretly met with a divorce attorney. He had threatened to leave the kids, even leave the country, if she tried to divorce him, and she feared that he would have her killed, that he was capable of that. Josh was the only one allowed to have a car at this point, and Susan would have to ride her bike to work 15 miles on a bike, on a busy road, to earn income for their family. Josh took out a $1 million life insurance policy, where, of course, he was the sole beneficiary. Susan most definitely feel feared for her life during this point, and she knew that she was worth more dead than alive. She knew it was just a matter of an accidental crash on her bike while she was riding to work. So one day while working at Wells Fargo, she wrote on a sheet of paper, Last Will and Testament for Susan. I bike to work daily and have been having extreme marital stress for about three or four years now. For mine and my children's safety, I feel the need to have a paper trail at work which would not be accessible to my husband. She wrote about the fights that they were having, the multi-million dollar life insurance policy in her name, and about the threatening comments her husband had made when discussing a possible divorce. If I die, it may not be an accident, even if it looks like one. Please take care of my boys. She then ended it with, For family and friends of Susan, all except Josh Powell, my husband. I don't trust him. She also mentioned her social media, videos, friends that would back up her fears, conversations she'd have, all for proof, paper trails, to show that her husband was being very abusive. A huge fight then followed, and she began to record and document her belongings in a video that has been described either for insurance purposes or for the fear of her life that she spoke of. July 29th, 2008, and we are in the 6254 West Sarah Circle House. This is me. Hi. Sorry. And it is, can you see that? 11.44 a.m. And I am documenting all our assets just in case of any emergencies, fire, flood, damage, disputes. Oddly enough, she kept wanting to have a third child. She was really hoping for a girl. Even as little as they were intimate, in June 2009, she thought she was expecting. She was not. She even mentioned that she hoped he would cheat on her to make leaving him easier. He did not. That would take a little more effort. Susan would worry that her boys would be as creepy as Josh's, or as creepy as Josh's father, 
or perhaps as unhinged as his brother Michael. During the fall of 2009, they even tried LDS Family Services for marriage counseling. They tried that. Josh even wore out the bishop. He had enough. He threw his hands up and said, I can't help you. This is beyond my ability to help during marriage counseling. During the fall, Susan noticed how many new tools her husband had just purchased. And she also thought she might be pregnant once again. November 9th, she was experiencing nausea and feeling dizzy. She couldn't hold food down at all. She had light bleeding, so perhaps not pregnant. November 10th, she wrote, Last night, I had leftover pizza. Josh brought home pizza from a computer geek thing he was doing. I felt fine until 9.30, and I snacked throughout the night. But my tummy hurt, and I had nausea all night. She finally went to the doctor after seven full days of non-stop nausea. Another negative pregnancy test. The doctor was confused with the results and the blood tests, so her friend suggested more blood tests. It was not normal. It was going on way too long. Something is going on. Something unusual happened during this time that she was feeling ill. November 16th. When Josh was dropping her off at work, he told her he loved her, something he hadn't done in ages, so much so that she almost missed it, but she did say it back. She loved that attention from Josh. It was so unexpected. You know, I was sitting here (laughs) wishing that this ended on a happy ending. And uh, due to the fact that it's simply on our channel, we know that that's not going to happen. But at least for part one, we will end right now with Susan Happy. Desi Madigan and I, John Crimes, will see you all here next week for the conclusion of our story on Susan Powell. Until then, stay safe.